Welcome to the London School of English Live. Uh, today we have an advanced English uh, live stream that will help you to sound more powerful in your speech using metaphors. Our expert English language trainer, John Dyson, has some really useful advice and expressions that will help you to sound impactful in spoken English. Uh, this live stream will be interactive, so please be sure to uh, participate and uh, uh, share your comments and questions in the live chat next uh, to the video. We will answer them during our Q&A session at the end. Here with us today, we also have Faiza Afzal from our sales team, who will share her advice on advancing your spoken English in our Q&A session. But before we start with the main content, Faiza, over to you for some information about our English language uh, training in London and online, and also some very exciting news. Thanks very much, Olga. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's session. As Olga said, we have some exciting news. So as you know, we have been open for face-to-face -face and online training for the last several months. And uh, a recent government announcement uh, yesterday, so it's hot off the press, if we want to use an expression, um, is the fact that uh, from Monday, if you are arriving from the EU or Switzerland and happen to be double vaccinated, then you no longer have to um, observe a quarantine period. So that's very exciting for any of our clients that are visiting us from those countries, uh, for them to be able to come straight into their face-to-face -face courses. Um, there is still a requirement for the day two test, but the quarantine is not um, needed. So uh, that's lots of exciting things and what we've been very happy to talk about today. Um, as we have a variety of courses, so there are face-to-face -face courses that are delivered at our center in Holland Park. Um, we're running a host of um, topics such as general English, business English, IELTS exam preparation as well. Online, we've got courses running at the moment that are focused on uh, legal English as well as English for university, general English, um, and then there's one-to-one -to -one training as well. Um, we offer flexibility, so for any clients that do need to quarantine, we still have our quarantine package um, that gives you a free week of uh, course and accommodation for the week that you would have to observe self-isolation. So whatever you need, um, we would be very happy to help you and to support you. Um, if you have any questions at all and you want to ask us more about our courses and how we can support you, please contact us at clients at londonschool.com. Olga's got the email there for you. Uh, please ask us any questions at all throughout the live stream today as well, and then you can follow up with us afterwards. So um, I think without any more, <laughs> I'll pass it over to uh, John to get things started. Great, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faisa, and thanks, Olga, and welcome to Mariana and Frank. Uh, first of all, uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to another live stream from the London School of English. My name is John Dyson, and I'm one of the trainers here at the London School of English. I'd like to thank you very much for joining our uh, live stream today. And the subject today is about the rich, diverse and exotic world of metaphors. So we'll start off with a question. And the question is, why use metaphors? And the answer to that is best expressed with a quote, which says, the metaphor is a powerful tool to use when you really want to enrich what you are saying and make the listener think that the picture you paint is very powerful. And there you are, that's a metaphor, the picture you paint, because I'm not literally painting a picture, I'm speaking to you, but I'm painting a picture using words, and that is a, a metaphor. So let's move on to the first part of the live stream, which is to ask a question uh, to distinguish between two types of things which are actually quite similar. And the question is, what are similes and metaphors? So there are two figures of speech in this area. One is a simile and the other is a metaphor. Let's look at the difference. A simile is something which makes a direct comparison with something similar. So the word simile, if you just think of it as being, well, it's an expression which talks about something similar. An example of this would be life is like a journey. Life is like a journey. So if you notice there, I'm saying it's like a journey. So it's comparing life and journeys. We're coming to this in a little bit more detail later on, 
But let me give you another couple of examples. The first example is from our most notable uh, writer, English writer, William Shakespeare. And in one of his plays, I believe it was uh, As You Like It, which is one of his comedies, he said, my love is like a red, red rose. Okay, my love is like a red, red rose which literally means that, uh, well, it doesn't literally mean anything, in fact, because what he's comparing his love to is a rose. Yeah, so you can see that is a, a, a direct simile. And as you can see in the picture, actually, that picture is of somewhere called the Globe Theatre, which is where Shakespeare's plays were originally performed. And if you come to London to do a course at the London School of English, you will have the opportunity to go and visit it because... Uh, they do guided tours around it. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. It's been reconstructed exactly as it would have been in the 16th century. So there you go. My life is like a red, red rose. And of course, to get a more up to date example of a simile, we have Forrest Gump. Because remember what Forrest Gump, my mama said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So again, we've got the direct comparison. Life is like a box of chocolates. Some of the things inside you like, some of the things you don't like so much, maybe soft or hard, Cho uh, milk chocolate, dark chocolate. So life is full of variety. You never know what's going to happen. You don't, you can pick out a, a chocolate and you don't know what's inside it until you bite. Okay, and another example, one more example, uh, a few more examples of similes um, so we've got this example, once he has a problem to solve, so somebody who, who's good at solving problems, once he has a problem to solve, he's like a dog with a bone. He's like a dog with a bone. He never gives up. So that means he keeps on trying and trying to solve the problem, just like a dog never lets go of its bone until it's finished eating everything it can possibly get off the bone. So that's another example, like a dog with a bone. And then another way we use similes is to use the expression as, adjective, as. And it's very often used with animals and birds. Let me give you a couple of examples. She's as cunning as a fox. As cunning as a fox, meaning as clever. Clever, not necessarily in the positive sense, meaning very good at ex escaping dangerous situations or finding ways to take advantage of, of uh, certain situations to get food. So that picture there is a fox, probably an urban fox. We have quite a lot of urban foxes in London nowadays. And the last example we've got of the uh, simile, another as adjective as, which is he's as wise as an owl. This is an owl, yes. And this bird is associated with wisdom, with being extremely intelligent, extremely experienced. He's as wise as an owl. So those are similes where there is a direct comparison and using the comparative structures. <clears throat> OK, uh, let's move on to metaphors. So what is a metaphor? Well, a metaphor is what we call a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. So if you remember in the first example we saw in the simile, we said life is like a journey, meaning it is similar to a journey. In the metaphor example, we would say life is a journey. Life is a journey. So we're not comparing it, we're saying it actually is that thing. And that is the main difference between similes and metaphors. So what we'll do now is move on to uh, the next part, part two, <clears throat> and we're going to look at something called extended metaphors. And extended metaphors basically means you can put one, two, three, or four metaphors, or more if you want, um, after each other. And they all have the same theme, and they're all talking about the same kind of area. If we take an example, we have for example, a crisis situation or a situation full of risk. So let's say that without applying a metaphor, we could be talking about, for example, a dangerous financial and economic situation for a country. 
a company, sorry. That is the literal meaning. It's a dangerous financial and economic situation. When we apply a metaphor to it, we could use a sea journey. So a journey by sea, which we call a voyage. A dangerous journey in this case, because the sea is very rough and choppy and the waves are very high. So you might use this extended metaphor in order to um, explain how you are entering a period of difficulty or uncertainty. And the example we have could be taken from a, a business meeting, for example, where the person says, the person speaking says, we are sailing into choppy waters. Let's hope we don't hit the perfect storm. What we need is stability in this organization. Whatever you do, don't rock the boat. Okay, so that's an example where somebody makes a little speech using three different metaphors. Sailing into choppy waters means entering a period of difficulty and uncertainty. Hit the perfect storm. The perfect storm means the coincidence, the worst possible coincidence of many major problems. For example, financially and economically, it would be, for example, um, a, a crash on the stock market combined with an economic recession, combined with a pandemic. So that would be everything at once, the perfect storm. And the last one, don't rock the boat. Not a good idea to rock the boat. The, in this case, what it means is the lifeboat, the boat that you are using to, uh, to escape from the sinking ship. And what it means is don't cause organizational instability. Don't cause instability. Don't argue. Don't complain. Just try and work together to keep the boat stable. Because if you rock the boat, what will happen? Well, you'll fall out. So that's the first example. We've, we've taken the metaphor of a very dangerous water voyage, voyage in the sea in this case, and we've applied it to a business situation. Now let's look at another example. Now the, the, the metaphor um, can obviously have positive or negative or neutral meanings. This is, a, this is a rather bigger example of an extended metaphor. And again, there are three different metaphors in this example, and it's somebody thinking sadly about their life. And they say, you know, sometimes my life feels as if I'm trapped in an elevator. I'm always going up or down. And most of the time, I'm not even the one pushing the buttons. So what do you think that means? Well, trapped in an elevator really means you are in a confined and limited space. So you have no space to move. You have no freedom. I'm always going up or down, which could talk about this person's emotional state. Up, they feel great. Down, they feel depressed. <clears throat> and then at the end, this person says, I'm not even the one pushing the buttons, which suggests I have no control over my life. So, yeah, limited perspective, um, positive and negative um, changes and not having control over your life. It's a rather pessimistic view of life, isn't it? But that's just an example. So again, as you can see, you can use that extended speech um, to introduce three different metaphors. And again, I would go back to my favourite playwright, the man I mentioned before about the Globe Theatre, Shakespeare. And one of his most famous metaphors was all the world's a stage. And all the men and women, merely players. When he said players, what he meant were actors and actresses. So life is just like a play at the theatre. All we do is we enter, we're born, we perform our part, and then we exit, we die. And that is what life is. And during that time, we play different kinds of roles. So yeah, Shakespeare, very clever writer. He used a lot of metaphors in his writing. And why do we do it? Again, I would come back to that initial definition. It's because we want to enrich our language. We want to paint a picture. Because as they say, picture paints a thousand words. That's a good metaphor. A picture paints a thousand words. 
Right, let's move on to part three. And in part three, we're going to look at themes for metaphors. And we'll take a look at an ex one example in particular. So in this case, what you've got is not so much an extended expression as pieces of individual vocabulary, in this case, verbs, which are organized along a particular theme. And I looked at the example because I'm mostly a business English teacher, but you could apply it to different examples. My example is marketing. Now, in the field of marketing, they use a lot of military verbs. So I think we have a text here, military terms. So uh, if, you, if we look at the text, it says we identified a target market and then we designed a marketing campaign. We launched the campaign with an advertising blitz and bombarded the target segment with direct mailing. It was so successful, we penetrated the market successfully and gained significant market share. So as you can see there, we have seven different verbs which we use specifically when we're talking about marketing. And they're all around that theme of uh, military. Uh, so we've got target. We've got to launch, just like you launch a rocket or a missile. So you launch a campaign. You have an advertising blitz. <clears throat> a blitz actually means when lots and lots of planes drop lots and lots of bombs on the area below. So an advertising blitz really is a, quite an aggressive term to use. And we bombarded the target segment. Again, to bombard means to drop bombs on areas. It was so successful, we penetrated. Yes, so to penetrate means to enter or to move into in quite an aggressive way. And we gained market share. And if you think about it, market share is a bit like territory in a company, in a country, sorry. So as you can see, very often, and that's the example I've used, is that you can take a certain area and you can apply a lot of different terms to that area. Another example might be foot, um, football, for example. We often use in a, um, in a meeting, we often say, let's kick off at the beginning of the meeting. And we use the expression, we need to tackle this issue. Tackle is when you take the ball off somebody in football, but it also means to address or deal with a particular issue. Okay, moving on to part four. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the uh, what I've done here is talk about metaphors which emerge from other ones which have previously been used. And there's a couple of expressions here I'd like to focus on, because one of them is a good question to ask somebody when you're socializing, even when you're networking, because it's a fascinating question. And the question is, uh, or the expression is, for example, in this case, visiting the Taj Mahal is on my bucket list. It's on my bucket list. Now, a bucket list is a phrase we use to talk about the things we would like to do or the places we would like to visit before we die. So with the time we have left in our lives. So why do we call it a bucket list? Well, it originates from the metaphorical expression to kick the bucket. And to kick the bucket is a very colloquial and informal way of saying to die. And don't use this in a formal context because it would sound very strange. So you wouldn't be saying to your boss, oh, I'm very sorry to hear that your father kicked the bucket. No, 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 too, too, um, too informal for that context. So um, that's one example that I've used. The second example, which is also... Uh, it's quite a useful idiomatic expression as a metaphor. And it is the expression, it's the early bird which catches the worm. It's the early bird which catches the worm. And that was the original expression. And it means the person who is quickest to take action or to take advantage of a situation is the person who will benefit most. So you can use it for a company launching a product and entering a new market. The company which launches its product first will probably sell the most products. And from that emerged 
um, an expression, the early bird menu. In many, many restaurants across London or anywhere in Britain, you will find um, between five o'clock or when the restaurant opens, five o'clock in the evening and let's say seven o'clock, they will have something called the early bird menu, which is cheaper and discounted and it's cheaper than the normal menu, but only between those times. So as you can see, if you are the early bird, you will be able to take advantage of that discount. Okay. Oh, and while we're talking about birds, uh, there's another expression which I think is always a favourite of mine. And that expression is, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. A bush is a little tree that you find on the ground. So what it means, basically, is better to have a small but certain and sure advantage now than only the possibility of a bigger advantage in the future. So, yes, I mean, I really introduced that phrase because it's got bird in it, but it's just an example of how you will find certain themes and animals is certainly one of them, where if you know a lot of animals, you can learn a lot of metaphorical expressions. Good. So now we're going to move on to part five. And this is talking about um, a very a situation which is quite powerful in itself, which is change. We live with change every day, every week. And one particular change, which is becoming more and more common as people are more mobile, is the opportunity to move to another country to live. Although having said that, I'm just thinking that perhaps it's not so easy to move to this country to live um, at the moment. But who knows? Things may change. Um, so move, when you move to another country to live, we, we do have a couple of very powerful metaphors that we use. <coughs> one of which expresses um, difficulties in change and the other one which expresses welcoming and adapting to change. The first one is... For example, if you move to uh, Spain, uh, you may feel like a fish out of water for a while. But I'm sure you'll take to life there like a duck to water. OK, so those are the two expressions. Again, two more animals, fishes and ducks. Well, and a fish out of water means that you are removed or taken away from your familiar surroundings into an unfamiliar and often challenging situation. So if you think about it, a fish out of water is a little bit, a bit like going to Spain and not really speaking very much Spanish. It's quite difficult to adapt at first. But there are people who welcome change. There are people who, who find it very easy to adapt to new situations. And those people take to something like a duck to water. Yeah. So, for example, he took to life in Spain like a duck to water. It was the easiest, most natural and most enjoyable thing in the world. No problem for him. He took to it like a duck to water. The second change scenario is, again, it's a very familiar one. It's uh, getting a new job in a challenging situation or a challenging environment. And again, uh, in this case, we have three expressions. And all of these expressions are using metaphors around water. And in specifically, a swimming pool. So the first one is, if we look at the expression, he was thrown in at the deep end. So it was a sink or swim situation for him. So far, unfortunately, it looks like he's out of his depth. So... The three expressions we've got there. The first one refers to being put or forced into a situation with no preparation when the situation is quite difficult, quite complex. Yeah, so you're forced into a very difficult situation without any preparation. And then we've got sink or swim. So you can say it was a sink or swim situation for him, or you can just say it was sink or swim, meaning... Either you sink, you sink, glug, 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 to the bottom of the pool, or you need, and you need to be rescued, or you start swimming like crazy just to keep your head above water. 
yeah so that you and eventually you will feel okay i can swim i can manage this it's the deep end but i can cope i can manage this situation but the last expression the last observation is oh dear i mean it was sink or swim but unfortunately it looks like he is out of his depth and what that means is he doesn't have the capacity to deal with the situation just like they say to you when you're having swimming lessons if you're not a very strong swimmer don't go in the deep end because you will be out of your depth that is the literal meaning so the figurative meaning the metaphorical meaning is unable to manage a situation because you don't have the skills to deal with it so if you're in a, uh, a situation like that, a new situation, it's a very, these are very powerful ways rather than simply saying, I don't have the skills to deal with this situation. Uh, it enriches your language if you can say, I'm sorry, but I'm out of my depth. There's one expression which I would like to, um, to show you, again, referring to a new situation or a, a change of environment, a change of country or organization or joining a new group of people or a club or something and there is a certain phrase we often use before many metaphorical statements many metaphors that before you use the statement you can say you know what they say well you know what they say sink or swim you know what they say you'd be thrown in at the deep end and I've got an example here of perhaps the best advice when you move to another country or join an organization, which is when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Now, I don't know why it's Rome in particular. I mean, the, the origins of this um, expression go back quite a long way, I believe, um, in time. But when in Rome, do as the Romans do basically means it is best to follow the conventions and adapt to the customs and the norms of that country or organization or group. So adapt yourself when in Europe, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. Right. Now we're going to have a quiz. So get ready to answer some questions. And thank you very hello Nicola. I didn't I didn't see you. Oh, Mariama, you're there. Everybody's there. Okay, good. So I'm gonna we're gonna have a look at six sentences. And some of these you will you will probably know the answer because we've seen them. Other ones you won't. So you're gonna try and guess what you think is the um uh, the best option of the four options you've got for each of these six sentences. Ready? Fingers on buzzers. Okay. Here's the first one. A. A bird in the ha- oh, I nearly said it there. A bird in the mm is worth two in the bush. Is it hand, pot, box, or arms? I said this one earlier, so I don't know if you remembered or not, but let's see. So a bird in the mm is worth two in the bush. Okay, I think I'm going to have to give you the answer here. Time is ticking. Uh, the answer here is a bird in the hand. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Excellent. Atilius, well done. Frank, well done. Right, this one, uh, you'll get this one right. Oh, yeah, look, everybody's getting it right. Marianne as well, Nicolo is getting it right. Well done, everybody. B, when I moved to Barcelona... <clears throat> when I moved to Barcelona, I felt like a mm, out of water for the first few weeks. Is it duck, swan, fish, or dog? Take your time. I'm going to have a little sip of tea. So when I moved to Barcelona, I felt like a mm, out of water for the first few weeks. Duck, swan, fish, or dog? Let's see. Okay, can I ask you? Ah, uh, fish out of water. Well done, Atilius. Atilius you, you're on the ball. You're on the ball with this one. It's another footballing metaphor. On the ball, it means for you're very alert. You're good at giving answers. Okay, well done, everyone. Uh, okay, C is one that we haven't seen in this live stream. So see if you can guess which is the right word here. Your 18th birthday is considered a very significant 
mm. in your life. Your 18th birthday is considered as a very significant mm in your life. Is it millstone, milestone, deadline, or target? Mm. Millstone, milestone, deadline, or target? This, this expression, this particular word means um, something which marks distance. So you often, often see it on old roads. Well done. We've got fish milestones. I think, Marianne, it, it's fish. Uh, milestones, sorry. Yes, well done, Olga. Thank you. Milestone. Yes, that's a real milestone. So, yeah, milestone is what you used to see at the side of the road, marking the number of miles to the next town or city. Okay, I'm going to move on. Time is passing, so I'll move on to D. At the press conference, the journalists, mm, the sacked CEO with questions about the complicated situation. Is it asked, rained, bombarded, or bombed? At the press conference, the journalists, mm, the sacked CEO with questions about the complicated situation. Okay, now the word, to tell you the truth, the word asked uh, I know it isn't possible. I was going to say it's possible, but it's not. No, because it's got the preposition with. So is it asked, rained, bombarded, or bombed? Let's have a look. Well, the answer is minus fish. Bombarded, Jenny. Well done. Yes. Bombarded. Pew, 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 pew. Lots of questions coming in. Yeah, very fast. Very difficult to react to. Uh, the fifth one. Well, when multiple crises coincide at the same time, we call it the mm storm. We call it the mm storm. Is it the critical storm, the disastrous storm, the awful storm, or the perfect storm? And we did see this one. Yeah. So I think I'm going to go forward with this quickly. The answer is the perfect storm. And I'm sure everybody's typing that in as I speak. And that suddenly I will see in the chat lots and lots of answers that say perfect. OK, I'll move on to the final one. She has to make some really important decisions about what her future will be. Her life really is at a hmm. And again, this is not one that we've seen during this live stream. So the four options are junction, dead end, crossroads or traffic light. She has some really important decisions to make about what her future will be. Her life really is at a hmm. So which of these four do you think it is? A junction? A dead end? Excellent, Attilius. You are obviously an advanced learner. At a crossroads. When something is at a crossroads, it means you can go the right way or you can go the wrong way. Yeah, the right way or the wrong way. It depends which way you choose to turn at the crossroads. I think that's a very powerful expression. Well, we're at a crossroads. We have to make a really important decision. If we make the wrong decision, things could turn out very badly. So, yes, when something is at a crossroads. OK, well, we're running out of time. I'm going to move on to my list of six powerful metaphors for the meaning of life. The meaning of life. I bet you didn't expect to be talking about the meaning of life tonight. But I'm going to give you some of my six of my favorite idioms so the first one what we'll do is give you the literal meaning of the expression of the metaphorical expression and we'll give you the context and the use of the metaphor so the first one means make the best of what life circumstances you have make the best of what life circumstances you have and the example is my sister lost her job when the factory closed but she used her severance money from the company to invest in the stock market. And now she's a millionaire. What can I say? If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So in this case, the lemons was the, the money she got when she left her job. And what did she do? She made more money. Yeah, make lemonade. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So make the best of what you've got. The second one. The, the literal meaning is even the worst situations 
can have a positive aspect to them. Even when some situation is really bad, there's still something positive you can find about it. So, for example, you failed the interview for the job. Well, at least you can learn from the experience. After all, every cloud has a silver lining. Every cloud has a silver lining. And you can see from the picture what it means. Clouds are bad. But the sun is there behind the clouds. And that's what makes the silver lining around the cloud. Yeah, so even the worst situations have a positive aspect. Okay, the third one is even in the most terrible of situations, there is always hope for the future. And of course, I have to use coronavirus somewhere in this uh, live stream. So it's about the vaccines. We said, thank goodness for the coronavirus vaccines. At least they provide some light at the end of the tunnel. Light at the end of the tunnel. Hope for the future. And you can see it coming. And there is light at the end of the tunnel because they're allowing people from overseas to come to Britain. So you can all come and learn English face to face at the London School of English, Holland Park. OK, my fourth one is if an unexpected opportunity suddenly appears and it will benefit you, don't hesitate. Take the opportunity. Now, this one is a rather strange idiom. It's uh, the example or the context we've given is. Well, you, you can get 50% discount on your membership if you renew now. Wow. Do it. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Now, why do we use that expression? I have to give a very quick explanation. Traditionally, before you buy a horse, the buyer checks the horse's teeth to see if they are in good condition as an indicator of general health. In this case, in this case, you're getting a 50% discount, then of course, it's free, it's almost free. It's, it's almost like a gift. So don't start inspecting the horse's mouth. Don't start arguing about the discount. Just take the opportunity, take the discount, because it's good value. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And number five, Avoid concentrating all your hopes and efforts in one area because you could lose everything if you do that. And the example that I've given is a business example where somebody says over 75% of my company's business is with one customer. Mm. And his friend says, mm, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. What would happen if that customer, if they decided to stop working with you? So it's dangerous to do that. It's dangerous not to spread the risk. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yes, don't rely on one thing to provide everything you need in future. It's a bit like investing in the stock market. Don't just invest in one company, invest in several companies, because what happens if something terrible happens to that company? And I'm not speaking from experience. I don't invest money like that. It's like a casino. And finally, number six, it is a waste of time. This is the real meaning, the literal meaning. It's a waste of time remaining upset and sad now about situations which have already happened and can't be changed. And the example we've got is, I know you made a big mistake and it's had consequences, naturally. But try to look forward after all. After all, there's no use crying over spilt milk. There's no use crying over spilt milk. So as you can see in the picture, you spill something, it goes all over the floor. <laughs> no, what's the point? Clean it up, move on. Yeah, look forward because you can't unspill the milk. Okay, um, so we, yeah, it's taken up a lot of time because there's so many metaphors to talk about. But I've come to the end of my uh, live stream. So remember, you can write in any questions you like and uh, Pfizer, Olga and myself will be very happy to answer them but I'll hand you back to Olga now. Thank you. 
Thank you, John, uh, for another fantastic live stream. It was really great uh, to see so many uh, interesting expressions and uh, also the participation from uh, our viewers who are joining us from different corners of the world. I just wanted to uh, to highlight uh, that we've got our alumni uh, joining, for example, Frank. Uh, and uh, it's always great uh, to see them. We also have Alena, uh, Alona Cho, who is saying that she's joining us from Singapore, uh, even if it's uh, late at night. So fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Alona. And uh, um, welcome to the live stream. Um, so um, we've got uh, we've got a couple of questions about uh, the use of metaphors and spoken English. Uh, but um, as promised, um, uh, we uh, have a question from uh, Frank uh, from mm -hmm. Frank uh, regarding uh, regarding travel to the UK, particularly from uh, France. Uh, Pfizer, can you uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. So at the present moment. Um, those traveling from France are still required to quarantine. Um, so the announcement from the government yesterday did stipulate that it was certain countries uh, from Europe that would allow um, double vaccinated travelers to be, um, they wouldn't have to observe the quarantine period, but for France, it's still necessary. Um, the UK government is revising the list there's a traffic light system in place of green, amber, and red, and that's uh, revised every three weeks. Um, so based on the status of which country you're in, you'll be able to see. Um, and this is basically the, the double vaccinated um, quarantine exemption is for anybody who's traveling from an amber uh, list country. Um, so again, it's best to keep up to date with what's happening on the UK government website. It does get updated and changed regularly. Uh, as we, as I said also um, earlier on, we can support you whichever way. So we've had some clients that, you know, have had to move from green list to amber list or amber list to green lists. And depending on what they needed, we we are now very um, well versed <laughs> in uh, being able to adapt to uh, whatever you might require, whether you need to quarantine or whether you don't. So just let us know and contact us at clients at London School if you need anything else. Great, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Pfizer. And uh, um, yeah, just uh, just in case, again, uh, we'll sh we're showing our contact information here. Um, and um, getting back to uh, to uh, the use of metaphors, um, um, John, uh, what are the best ways of learning English metaphors? Hmm. Um... Okay, there are various things. I think if you're if you're wanting to learn them passively to to understand what they are, then reading magazine articles rather than newspaper articles, because magazine articles and short stories, for example, tend to contain quite a lot of metaphors. Uh, if you're watching then uh, dramas, uh, films, television series, uh, if you're you know actively, if you want to use them, then you have to use them. <laughs> That's it. You have to practice, and even if you use them wrongly, then if you're you know in a language context, language school context, then hopefully the teacher is going to put you right and say, "Oh, it's really good that you tried to use it, but that's not quite the right use. You would use it in this context or in this uh, way grammatically." And my suggestion about learning these um, uh, metaphorical expressions is that you you learn the phrase, the complete phrase, as one piece of vocabulary rather than a um, you know, breaking it down into small parts of the sentence. Um, one way of learning is to look at themes rather than looking at individual words. So take the, the I've looked at a lot of themes during this, this talk. Water was one of them. Animals is another. Journey is another. That's just three examples of where you can generate a lot of metaphorical expressions and similes, um, which you can, you know, you can try and connect them. Maybe that will trigger your memory of how you use the um, what the particular metaphor is and the final thing i would say is learn the expression you know what they say because many british speakers native speakers will talk and then at the end of it they say you know what they say and when they say that expression you can guarantee that they will use a metaphor or an idiomatic expression after mm -hmm. that so that's a few things to think about I was also uh, wanting to share, John, your point about themes, and you'd mentioned sports in um, in a work mm -hmm. context, for example, yeah. um, and it, it just to give some 
of our listeners an example of a North American um, context. So when I was working in North America, you often have baseball references. Um, and so, for example, you touch base with people, um, you pitch a product or an idea. Um, you might say off the bat, what would you like to discuss? And that means like, what would you like to start the discussion with? Um, you can often, when you're talking about figures, ask for a ballpark figure. Uh, so it's it's interesting as well that the themes can depend on where you are. Um, so it might be football in the UK, but it might be baseball um, if you're having conversations in North America. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. And that leads me to the next question. Uh, um, John and Paisa, what uh, is your advice on translating metaphors from different languages into English? I, I think what I'd suggest is like giving an example and sort of I've, you know, work with many people from many different places, have friends that come from different parts of the world. And oftentimes, you know, you could be having a conversation and it's, it's the equivalent of what John was saying of, you know what they say. Um, you could instead say, in my country, you, we, we have this expression and it goes like this um, and then see if there's something similar. So to give you guys a, an example, there's an expression in Bangla which translates to, you can be a horse among donkeys. Is there a similar expression in English? Mm, okay. So that's always a really good way to be like, you'd, even the you know the two birds in a hand is worth one in the bush type thing. There can be, yeah. uh, if you at least explain it in your own language, then somebody can be like, oh, you know what? There's actually a very similar one in English too. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd agree absolutely with what Pfizer said. I mean, I, I went to Spain and lived there for 20 years and learned a lot of idiomatic expressions and loved them because they're so, they're so interesting. Um, I learned, for example, matar a dos pájaros de un tiro, which actually means to kill two birds with one shot. So the Spanish are a little more um, violent than the British in that respect. We, we throw a stone, we don't shoot the birds, but it was very similar in meaning. So in that case, it's like, oh, well, it's practically the same expression. I can learn that. But there were other expressions, and one example was uh, this one, no tiene pelos en la lengua, which means, literally translated means, she doesn't have hairs on her tongue, which sounds really strange in English until you realize it's the equivalent of saying about somebody that she will be very honest and will say exactly or directly what she thinks, even if it isn't positive and it hurts the other person's feelings. Mm. Yeah, so it, it, it for me, oh, okay, right, the hairs, tongue, yeah, I made some 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 kind of association of ideas there. Because so you, you have the expression, like, you can have a sharp tongue in English, yes, yes. Which, which usually means you're quite yeah. direct and to the point. Um, yeah, yeah. In North America, so maybe, they take it away from the tongue and they say you're like a straight shooter, if you oh, okay. say what you're love, supposed to. Because they love guns. So. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, we, sharp we tongue is what I thought of. We have a comment from uh, Marianne uh, who um, answers this as, oh, you can use an interpreter <laughs> to translate the metaphors, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, using an interpreter is, uh, is a very valid way of translating. Uh, perfectly from one language to another. But for those of our clients who, uh, and our viewers who are thinking of doing it all themselves and speaking, uh, improving their uh, English, um, particularly spoken English, uh, to an advanced level, then uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how we help them in our training, uh, in, uh, in our class and outside of the class as well? Yes, I, um, I can share a little bit about that. So we, the different courses we have, you're placed in a group with people who are a similar level to you. So depending on how high um, your English level is, the content will be tailored um, accordingly. So for example, if you are at an advanced level, then there will be a lot more around the idiomatic language, around like understanding perhaps the context of when you're um, saying something, understanding the nuance of things. So a lot of these metaphors, for example, it's not literally what is said, it's understanding what might be meant or because of, um, you know, the 
picture you're trying to paint or because of the context of a situation. Um, what I think often um, our trainers also do is ask you to look at different resources as well. So we have these graded readers that as you go up higher level, um, you'll be able to kind of read a little bit more complicated language, like John was saying, perhaps in magazine articles or short stories where you would find this type of language. Um, and then perhaps even things like podcasts, for example, that, you know, when you're just learning the language for the first time, you might be asked to watch videos to look at subtitles so that, you know, it's two mediums in which you can engage with the language, you can listen to it and you can read it and you can try and understand it. But as you get to a higher level, it might be about sort of listening, seeing if you can understand it, seeing if you can hear also perhaps the nuance sometimes, especially with a lot of these metaphors and similes, some of it's in the delivery as much as it is what you say, like whether it's a joke, whether it's an expression, whether you're trying to make, for example, whether you're trying to make light of a situation, which is whether you're trying to joke about a situation. So how it's said can also give you a lot of um, understanding. And that's the, the type of things you're taught when you're trying to understand language at a slightly higher level um, than if you were just learning it, the, like the core language to, to build that up. Great, thanks, Faisa. Um, John, do you have anything uh, to uh, um, to add? I've got an extended metaphor, which, which <laughs> learning a language is like climbing a mountain. At first, you make lots of progress, but eventually, you reach a plateau. Now, you can stay where you are, but there's not much to look at, and it isn't very challenging. So, you decide to set off to the top. It's tougher. Progress is slower. It's more tiring. It's steeper but it is worth the effort because when you get to the top, the view is magnificent and you feel a tremendous sense of achievement. What about that? Mm -hmm. That's that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In fact, we have uh, uh, one of our viewers, Giovanna Casa, who is uh, actually using the method metaphors uh, from, from the live stream already. <laughs> um, she's, uh, there's a correction here uh, to, uh, Thank you. I uh, I grab it. I grab it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you get it. That's great. So the picture you're trying to paint, just as John did just then, of all of us climbing a mountain in your journey towards becoming a very high-level English language speaker. And the good thing about yeah. being an advanced English speaker is you never have to come back down the mountain. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that's also, true. we have a comment from Marianne uh, Van Bale, who is uh, uh, our alumni, and he, she's ah. saying, that, uh, re in reference to her previous comment, that uh, thinks that's a joke. I'm an interpreter, and uh, I visited the school to full satisfaction. So that's great to uh, to have you uh, joining us, Marianne, and we hope to see you at some point soon. Uh, if you are ever in London, don't hesitate to uh, to come in and say hello. Uh, and on this note, um, we need to wrap up the event. Uh, and I would like to say thank you, many, many thanks uh, to our viewers for your very active participation. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, very soon, maybe in London, maybe online. Uh, and uh, we actually maybe have, both. <laughs> yeah, maybe both in hybrid uh, uh, format. And uh, also, we for anyone, uh, for those of you who are interested to learn more about. What our general, what our courses are like. We actually um, are. Uh, we actually will have a live stream next week, which will um, talk specifically about what you can expect in our general English uh, group courses. So please be uh, sure to join if you're interested uh, to find out more about this. And uh, of course, I would like to say huge thanks to John for preparing this fantastic uh, content. Um, as always, uh, it's just uh, it's it's always amazing and very interesting and exciting to see, uh, and uh, to Faiza for uh, helping us with her advice and uh, um, and the tips on uh, how to improve um, your language and also uh, how to improve your communication skills uh, in general. So on this note, we wish you. A wonderful rest of the day wherever you are um, or night if you're in Singapore and uh, uh, we uh, we look uh, forward to seeing you very soon bye-bye bye, -bye. Bye, bye thanks very much Olga bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.